Hi there. I'm Howard Levy. I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins University. I'm both a primary care internist and a geneticist. And I'm very happy to be here today, at least virtually, uh, telling you a little bit about hypermobility spectrum disorders. So with that, let me move down. Uh, I have no financial or other conflicts of interest. Uh, and this is my agenda for today, really only two things. I was asked to talk about what hypermobility spectrum disorder or HSD is, but I think really a critical part of this discussion also has to be why this diagnostic term was created to begin with. So I'm actually gonna start with the why and then end with the what. Um, and there isn't a whole lot of material that I have here, so I think we should have plenty of time for questions and answers afterwards. So why? Let's start thinking uh, just about the types of symptoms that most people are presenting with when they come to a healthcare provider with questions about, is this Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? And I think most of the audience is familiar with these issues. There's often pain, joint laxity, hypermobility, instability, things like that. There's a significant increase in likelihood of things like POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, NMH is neurally mediated hypotension, and then CV there stands for cardiovascular autonomic dysfunction. So as a group, uh, what we're talking about here is problems regulating heart rate and blood pressure. Uh, and any of you that get dizzy, lightheaded, or even pass out with standing up quickly or prolonged standing or in heat and when you're dehydrated, you know full well what we're talking about here and you're wondering why I'm belaboring the point. Uh, GI symptoms, cramping, bloating, slow GI transit or diarrhea, et cetera. Again, if you have it, you know it. If you don't have it, good for you. Uh, and then a variety of other chronic problems. So really the issue at hand becomes, why not just call all of this EDS? Or, or before I get to that question, the question is simply, is this hyper, hypermobility type EDS or is there something else causing these symptoms? Um, and there are reasons legitimately, uh, legitimate desires why people would want to just call all of those groups of symptoms hypermobility Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And I'm going to walk through the reasons on this slide, and I think you can probably already tell that I'm going to uh, validate these reasons and then tell you why they're not sufficient to just call everything hypermobility EDS. So no surprises here, but let's walk through the list. It is certainly really, really helpful to end the diagnostic odyssey. Raise your hand if you've had symptoms for years and it took a long time to get to this group. And then look around the room. Uh, well, there's no one else in the room where you are, but odds are you're probably raising your hand if you're a patient with one of these conditions. So it's gratifying, it's helpful to stop having to search and instead have a name for what's wrong with you. And that helps with people believing that you're not actually faking it and accepting that you have something to cause your problems. Um, and it just feels better having a diagnosis. And this is something that, that I like to call the Alfred Hitchcock effect. Any of you who are fans of or ever watched an Alfred Hitchcock movie, you may be aware or maybe you weren't aware that part of what made him brilliant at scaring the bejeebers out of the audience is that he didn't show you the monster. He let your imagination create whatever was most scary to you and let that be the source of the terror. And it's my belief that that applies very much in healthcare and medicine. When you don't know what's wrong with you, it can be incredibly scary because you have no idea what's around the next corner. Whereas having a name for it provides some security. And even if it's bad news, at least you have a sense of knowing what's coming. There's a common belief that you have to have a diagnosis before you can properly manage your condition or that having a diagnosis better informs the type of management that you should get. Uh, and I'm gonna challenge that thinking as well in the course of this presentation. There is an all too common problem with getting access to be included in a support group or find the right support group if you don't have a diagnosis. There are unfortunately huge problems with insurance coverage or other third party payer coverage or just permission to get referral for services that one needs if one doesn't have a diagnosis. And then again, validation to skeptics, whether it's family and friends, healthcare professionals, employers, you know, again, raise your hand if you or a loved one has been accused of faking it and not really having anything wrong with you and being told it's all in your head. And again, look around the room, chances are everybody in the room is raising their hand 
because by the time you get to the Ellers Danlos Society, odds are you haven't been believed and you've needed to validate your condition. So these are all reasons why it serves a purpose to just call all of this hypermobility EDS. It gives it a name, it validates it, it makes it real. So why not call it all hypermobility EDS? There's lots of reasons. The first that I wanna emphasize is diagnostic accuracy. There are actually hundreds, hundreds of alternate or other genetic diagnoses that could explain pain or joint hypermobility. And I'm gonna show you some of that information on the next slide. And that's just the genetic diagnoses. There are also hundreds of non-genetic causes of joint hypermobility and pain and cardiovascular autonomic dysfunction and so forth. So it's not always correct to call it hypermobility EDS. That's not always the right diagnosis. Here's an example that you can do at home if you wanna play along. OMIM, Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man, and the web address is here for you, it's very easy, omim.org, is essentially an online encyclopedia of genetic conditions, thousands and thousands of genetic conditions and genes recorded in this database. If you go to OMIM, as I did on June 28th, and search the word pain, you will get 830 hits. And if you exclude the term Ehlers, so look for the non-Ehlers downloads entries for pain, 809. So only 21 of these 830 genetic conditions related to pain, only 21 of them are related to ehlers danlos syndrome, the other 809 are not. Similarly, if you search joint laxity or joint hypermobility, you'll get 334 entries, 270 of which are not ehlers danlos syndrome. And then if you search POTS or autonomic, you get 233 hits, only one of which is a form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Now, you're hopefully thinking, well, okay, but what if I've got pain and joint laxity? Well, there's 40 that include both pain and joint laxity, and only 14 of those are Ehlers-Danlos syndromes, and 26 of them are not. And likewise, if you combine pain and POTS or autonomic, you get 63 hits, of which none of them, none of them is actually an Ehlers-Danlos syndrome hit. And then if you combine joint laxity or joint hypermobility with POTS or autonomic, you only get five entries, of which four are not Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So the main point I'm making here is that there are a lot of non-Ehlers-Danlos genetic conditions that can manifest with pain, joint hypermobility, and cardiovascular autonomic dysfunction. The other point, if you look especially at this line here, where none of the hits was Ehlers-Danlos, is that while OMIM is really good, even that is not complete. So there's still stuff missing. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome in OMIM does not give you a hit for pain plus POTS or autonomic dysfunction. So the situation is actually even worse than I've just demonstrated to you. There are lots and lots of other causes for these complex conditions or, or associations of symptoms. So it's a mistake to call them all the same thing if they're not. Ending the diagnostic odyssey, is a great thing if it's done correctly. But what if it's done incorrectly? If we give you a name for your condition and that's not what you actually have, then we could be delaying giving you the correct diagnosis. So as a little thought experiment, the reason we're doing this over video right now and not in person is because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And ask yourself the question on the slide here, what if we just said to everybody who has cough and shortness of breath and fever, you've got COVID-19, we're not even gonna test you, we're not gonna think about pneumonia or influenza or anything else, we're just gonna call this COVID-19. Well, that would be a terrible thing to do. It's misinformation, it could be the wrong diagnosis, it would lead to unnecessary fear and severe precautions, isolating and quarantining, that might not be necessary if it's not COVID-19. And it would bring about mistreatment opportunities. If you've got influenza and we catch it in the first few days, we've got a drug for that that actually shortens the course. If you've got pneumonia with a run-of-the-mill bacteria, run-of-the-mill, pneumonia is never run-of-the-mill. But if you've got pneumonia with a bacteria that we could treat with an antibiotic and we don't give you that antibiotic, we've done you a disservice. So there's a world of difference between joint hypermobility syndromes and COVID-19, and I'm not trying to equate them at all. But I believe the concept is the same, that giving a correct diagnosis is important, but giving an incorrect diagnosis has significant risks of 
again, misinformation, unnecessary steps, unnecessary precautions, and missed opportunities. Why else not to call it EDS? So again, thinking about treatment and management, just to reemphasize the point, there are other conditions that cause joint laxity and pain that do have specific treatments. And if we give you the wrong diagnosis, we're failing to open the door to you for, the, for a more correct, more helpful treatment. And furthermore, while on that slide of reasons to just call it all hypermobility EDS, I had on there the idea, the belief that many people have that you need a diagnosis to get treatment. In fact, there are no treatments, none that are specific to either hypermobility EDS or HSG. All of the treatments that we offer are symptom-based. We are trying to relieve the particular problems you're having, but none of them are specific to EDS you'd get the same treatment recommendations if you had some other cause for your joint laxity and pain and autonomic dysfunction and GI symptoms and so forth. Next slide, thinking about belief and acceptance. Again, you've all, most of you, have experienced disbelief that you have a real problem. You've been accused of making it up or that it's all in your head or that it's a psychological or psychiatric problem. And if we use our diagnostic terms indiscriminately, if we just label everybody with pain and joint laxity as having EDS, that generalizes it so much that it's not actually true. And that can worsen the disbelief on the part of everybody else, be they healthcare providers, employers, insurance companies, uh, companies that are uh, adjudicating disability claims, if we denigrate the name HEDS and use it indiscriminately, then, then we're, we're adding fuel to that fire of people not believing that it's a real diagnosis. We have to use it correctly if we expect people to take it seriously as a real diagnosis. Uh, and then finally, really importantly, if we don't clearly discriminate what is HEDS and what is something else, we are severely handicapping our ability to learn more about it. Discovering the gene or genes that underlie HEDS requires that everybody that we label with HEDS all have the same thing. If they don't, and we ask the scientific question, what gene is always disrupted in people who have this condition, if they don't all have the same condition, we're not gonna find the gene or the genes because it's too much of a mixed pot. And then once we know for sure what is HEDS, and what are the other specific conditions that prior to these recent years we've been labeling with HEDS? Once we know what they actually are, then we can do much better science to understand what is truly part of that particular disease or syndrome. What is the natural history? What is the prognosis? We can eliminate that Hitchcock fear effect and tell you with a lot more accuracy what your particular condition predisposes you to and what it does not that you no longer need to worry about. And then of course, once we know that, then we can start much more intelligent approaches to developing, evaluating, testing, and implementing treatments that actually do make a difference. So all of that great science that's been our goal for decades depends on knowing for sure what it is that we're talking about. And until recent years, we've not been that rigorous. We need to be that rigorous. Okay, a few other thoughts, support groups. Yes, you, you kind of need to have the golden ticket, if you will, to get access to a support group, but that shouldn't be a problem. HSD is absolutely included in the Ellers Dental Society. This is a group, a support group and a, and a research group that is intended to, to support and help people with hypermobility syndromes, be it hypermobility EDS, vascular EDS, classic EDS, any other type of EDS or HSD. You're in the club. You don't have to call it HEDS to be in this club. And if you've got something that truly doesn't belong in the EDS spectrum at all, then if we can name what that condition is, again, that's a good thing. You can go to the correct support group so you can share your stories and your experiences and gain the knowledge and support of people who do have whatever it is that you might have if it turns out not to be HEDS or HSD or a related condition. And regarding insurance and validation and belief, uh, in my experience, it's not the world's experience, but, but in my experience, what the insurance companies and employers want 
is a diagnosis. And even better, they want a diagnosis that has some evidence behind it that they can believe. You don't have to have HEDS to qualify for insurance coverage. You have to have a diagnosis. And that diagnosis has to be supportable so that when people turn to the healthcare provider to ask, does this patient really have something that, that is medically wrong? We healthcare providers need to have a name for it that we can give you and the employer and the insurance company to say, yes, this is a real thing. Believe it. Treat this person the way they need to be treated. So it needs a name, but that name doesn't have to be HEDS. Okay, so 2017, hopefully everyone in this audience has already heard of the 2017 diagnostic criteria. This is just an introductory slide to, to point you to the actual issue uh, of the American Journal of Medical Genetics in which it was published in March of 2017. Uh, and two papers in particular to call out, the top one highlighted uh, here was the overall summary of all of the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. And that one includes the criteria for diagnosing hypermobility Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And then the second paper here is the one where the criteria for HSD are laid out. Um, and uh, I'm leaving the slide up for a moment so that you can uh, capture whatever it is that you need to capture if you wanna search this for yourself. But down here in the bottom corner are a couple of hyperlinks. Um, and it's these last uh, letters and numbers at the bottom here that you would wanna to use to try to find it directly with that. Um, so I've probably spent enough time on that. And when you're rewatching this later, if we make it available, you can always rewind and just freeze on this screen so you can get those links. Uh, wrong button, sorry. So the criteria for HEDS, for all of the reasons that I just outlined in the why first half of this discussion, the goal has been to be much more specific and much less sensitive in the criteria for hypermobility EDS. What that means is when we label someone with hypermobility EDS, we wanna be sure that it really is, that specificity. And we know that in doing so, we're going to incorrectly or falsely exclude some people who actually do have HEDS, but didn't quite meet the strict criteria. So lower sensitivity, not sensitive enough to capture everybody who has it, but specific enough to reduce that risk of falsely including people who don't have HEDS. And then once we get to the utopian land or the dreamed of land of knowing the genetic underpinnings and having a better test for HEDS, then we'll be able to come back around and reclassify some people who didn't make the current diagnostic criteria, but turn out to really have HEDS. So this is still a moving target. And indeed uh, the, the EDS society uh, has convened or has continued the, the, uh, the groups of, of experts internationally working on revising these diagnostic criteria to try to make it as good as we can until we get to the point of having a gold standard diagnostic test like we do for the other types of EDS. So knowing that the criteria for HEDS became much more strict and that they will falsely exclude some people who have HEDS and more importantly will exclude people who still have a hypermobility syndrome, but don't have HEDS. The recognition was, need, was made that we need a term to, to validate that this is a real diagnosis, that people with these conditions have a medical abnormality that may not actually be EDS or may not be HEDS or any other known condition, but it is still a medical problem that should be taken seriously. And that third bullet is in quotes because it is word for word out of the paper that I referenced a couple of slides ago. Um, and the other point to mention here is that HSD, the S stands for spectrum. So again, I just wanna reemphasize that this is not a single condition. This is the entire group of hypermobility conditions that range in a spectrum from almost asymptomatic to severely symptomatic. And I will show you that, I think it's on my next slide actually. Yeah, the graphical concept. So on the left side of the screen over here is the concept of someone who has joint hypermobility, JH is joint hypermobility, or even generalized joint hypermobility, but only that. Just kind of loosey-goosey, able to do some party tricks with no other symptoms. And a person who is not suffering from their joint hypermobility, they probably don't need a diagnosis. They probably don't need to be stigmatized or labeled with any type of diagnostic term. They just have loose joints and they're doing okay with it. Now it's a spectrum. They may develop symptoms later 
So they may move to the right of this screen somewhere along the spectrum of hypermobility disorders. And at the far right end is the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes overall, a subset of which, the largest subset, is the hypermobility type of EDS. So again, think of it as a spectrum from the left side of just loose joints, not affecting life in any other way, maybe even helping, because sometimes it's cool to have loose joints. You can get out of tight situations. All the way to the right side where that's not a good thing at all, and it's got a lot of morbidities, problems, chronic diseases associated with it, but a whole spectrum in between. So for the purposes of this diagnostic framework and the diagnostic criteria for HSD, there was an effort to sort of think through different ways that joint hypermobility can be classified. So at the top of this table is the term generalized joint hypermobility. And the definition of that is generalized. It affects the whole body. So all four limbs, meaning both arms and both legs, plus what's called the axial skeleton or the spine, essentially. The, the skull and the spine is what we call the axial skeleton. So generalized joint hypermobility affects all of the joints in the body. Maybe not all of them, but could affect all of them and should affect at least some of them diffusely in any part that you happen to look at. Whereas localized joint hypermobility only affects a few joints, typically less than five, sometimes only one or two, uh, but it can be any joints. It can be a large joint or a small joint or a mix of large and small joints. So large joints think shoulders, hips, elbows, knees. Smaller joints, we're talking about the joints in the hands and the feet. <clears throat> and this can be unilateral one side or it can be bilateral both sides. It can be symmetric or asymmetric. So it can be the right hip and the left ankle and uh, the right thumb, or it could be only joints on the left side of the body. It doesn't matter, that's somewhat random. So those two types are generally well accepted and you'll see them throughout the literature in lots of different places. The other two are a little bit more speculative, but are at least things that we anecdotally have seen in practice. So for this framework, they're at least listed as possible additional classifications of joint hypermobility. Peripheral joint hypermobility, PJH, is unique in that it only affects the small joints in the hands and feet, hands and or feet. So it's all four limbs, both hands, both feet. So it's not localized, um, but it excludes the large joints and the spine. So it's not generalized. So it's neither LG, L, I'm sorry, LJH nor GJH, uh, but just hands and or feet. So we give that the term PJH, peripheral joint hypermobility. And then the fourth category uh, that those of you over approximately age 40 or so will resonate with, at least some of you, is this idea of historical joint hypermobility. So we know that with age and sometimes with other things that happen over time, joint hypermobility decreases. And in fact, that's true for the general population. Babies and infants and toddlers are really hypermobile. I believe personally that that is an evolutionarily protective thing because when you're learning to walk, if you fall down, it's better to have a subluxation than to break a bone. So we start out really loose early in life. And as we go through life, we lose that laxity. And then as we get to old age, we get kind of stiff and arthritic. It's a natural progression. So what do you do with someone who has sort of aged out of their generalized joint hypermobility, were really loose as a child or young adult, but by the time they come to medical attention, no longer can be diagnosed with G, uh, GJH because they aren't that loose anymore? And the answer is, well, if we have a reliable tool that can document that prior joint hypermobility, then we'll call that historical joint hypermobility. So it can be evaluated in its own right as, as something that, that may eventually be, be able to be figured out. So that's the fourth category of joint hypermobility that goes into the diagnostic framework for HSD. <clears throat> now, there are two pieces to diagnosing HSD. One is the type of joint hypermobility, and the second is the presence of musculoskeletal effects. Um, and the key thing that I wanna emphasize here is what's in bold at the top of the slide. This is regardless of whether it's EDS or HSD or anything else. These are things that can happen to people who have loose joints. It does not matter what you call the diagnosis, and it doesn't matter if you call the diagnosis what it actually is or not. These are simply consequences of joint hypermobility. And most of this is, again, probably common sense to those of you who are already living with joint hypermobility. There can be instability, dislocations, subluxations, 
bones coming out of the socket. There can be soft tissue injuries, tendonitis, ligament tears, other soft tissue tears, advanced arthritis, other trauma to the joints and the surrounding tissues. There can be chronic pain for lots of reasons. We're not gonna go off on the tangent in this presentation about all the different types of pain. We're just gonna summarize it here to say there's lots of ways that loose joints can contribute to pain. Uh, reduced proprioception, the sense of where your joints are, which is really critical to moving around correctly and minimizing your risk of trauma and injury and dislocation and falling down. There's good evidence that, uh, while well, we don't know why, there is some loss of proprioception in people who have loose joints. And then a collection of other things that I didn't list all of them out here, but they're in the paper. Uh, flat feet, scoliosis, a number of other um, orthopedic, orthopedic uh, musculoskeletal effects of loose joints. I almost used the word minor, and that's the wrong word to use for this because if you've got it and it's problematic, it's not minor. Um, but they're sort of lumped together in this fourth category, fifth category of other manifestations of joint hypermobility. So musculoskeletal effects summarized on this slide types of joint hypermobility on the prior slide. Final point, um, before we get into what is HSD as the final summing up. We always, at least I always get the question, what about my fill in the blank? I talked about some of this on the first slide. What about my cardiovascular autonomic dysfunction? What about my gastrointestinal problems? What about my chronic fatigue? What about all of the other things that are either clearly associated or possibly associated with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome? The answer to that is it's real. We still don't understand it, but it doesn't matter whether it's HEDS or HSD or any of a number of other connective tissue disorders. Those associations are too nonspecific to be used as a diagnostic criteria because they happen with so many other conditions. And currently at least, because HSD is still relatively new and we haven't had enough research done yet, there is no distinction in the prognosis or the natural history of these other associated problems, whether we call it HEDS or HSD. These are real valid problems and being called a patient with HEDS or HSD has no impact or bearing or change in likelihood of developing those problems. So summing it up, the hypermobility spectrum, you saw the top half of this slide earlier when I was just emphasizing the spectrum and the bottom half table here summarizes how we apply a diagnosis. It's a little bit oversimplified, but I think it gets the key points across. So over here, the Bighton score is our gold standard for assessing joint hypermobility. It is by no means the correct gold standard. It's simply the best of what we have available today. And there's still work ongoing to come up with better tools for assessing joint hypermobility. So for now, we're using the Bighton score. And people with GJH, generalized joint hypermobility, even if it's asymptomatic, they'll have a positive Bighton score. And clearly people with HEDS have to have a positive Bighton score. It's the first part of the diagnostic criteria. The center cell here is broken up into four lines for the four types of hypermobility that we talked about earlier. So someone with generalized, oops, I missed my target, generalized joint hypermobility, they're gonna have a positive Bighton score with a generalized HSD diagnosis. The peripheral HSD, uh, that's gonna be usually negative because remember that was just hands and feet. Uh, so that's probably not gonna give you a five or higher Bighton score, but sometimes it might. Next one down, the localized, uh, that would be just a few joints. And by definition, it's fewer than five. So that should always have a negative Bighton score. And then finally, the concept of historical hypermobility spectrum disorder that would have a previously positive Bighton score or some other test for joint hypermobility that was previously positive and no longer positive. So there's the top row is uh, evaluating the joint hypermobility for these three diagnostic columns, GJH, asymptomatic, or HSD, or HEDS. And then the bottom row is those musculoskeletal manifestations. And by definition, if you are asymptomatic, you will have none of the musculoskeletal manifestations. If you have HSD, you will have one or more of those musculoskeletal manifestations. And if you have HEDS, usually you have one or more of them. Although if you look through the diagnostic checklist for HEDS carefully, it's possible to be diagnosed with HEDS just based on your joint hypermobility, some skin and soft tissue manifestations that don't quite 
fall into the bucket that we're calling musculoskeletal on this slide. Uh, and then family history could be an, an additional component that sort of gets you over the hump and, and gets you the HEDS diagnosis. So usually, but not always, musculoskeletal manifestations for HEDS. Uh, so that's the diagnostic framework. And hopefully I've laid that out clearly enough to make sense to all of you. And we can certainly go into more detail on that in the question and answer session if I didn't make any of that clear. And I think, yeah, that was the last slide that I had planned. So with that, I will turn it back over to Alan uh, for his presentation and then we can regroup for the question and answer period. Thank you for your attention.